major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight, people are gathering at Petco Park to pay their respects to Peter Seidler. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. The San Diego Padres owner, Peter Seidler, passed away earlier today. He was 63 years old. Seidler was a fan favorite and maintained he wanted to bring a championship to the city. He also was a large philanthropist. And KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman is live outside of Petco Park, where a memorial is set up. Matt. Yeah. Maya, pretty much all day since around midday, fans have been coming down to this spot at the ballpark to pay their respects to Peter Seidler. You can see over my shoulder right here, somewhat of a memorial has been set up where people are bringing cards and flowers, trying to remember him. You know, some people have been crying, remembering that all he did for the city and team. And a lot of the people we spoke to earlier say that he was the best owner in team history, not just for the on the field product, but how he invested in the community. He loved San Diego. And I think he put everything he had into the team and the fans. And that doesn't happen very often anymore. Seidler joined the Padres ownership group in 2012 before becoming majority owner in 2020. He was beloved by fans, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in star players to try and bring a championship to San Diego. So to see an owner that wanted to go all in, it was just something unfathomable because that's nothing we'd seen in years. So. For Papa P to do something like this, even though maybe he knew he was on his way out, he wanted to give the city something to appreciate. You know, it's, it's an honorable thing to do for sure. And we're always going to remember him as an owner, one of the best owners that we've had in years because he was actually willing to spend the money for a team that could take him to the playoffs. Seidler was a two-time cancer survivor. He and his wife, Sheil, donated to numerous medical charities, including the American Cancer Society, the Mayo Clinic, and the Lucky Duck Foundation, which focuses on homelessness efforts in San Diego. Peter Seidler is obviously the greatest owner in Padres history, I, in my opinion. And uh, not just that, he was really a good person for the community, huge philanthropist and just did so much good for San Diego. Creating a better future for the region's unsheltered population was something close to Seidler's heart. He spoke earlier this year with KPBS's Maya Trabolsi about how he wanted to use the Padres' profile to create a bigger impact. The ballpark is a place for joy. You know, people come out here and they want to forget their worries. And for a long time, I thought, you know, this is my personal endeavor. But I think now that the homeless population has grown and currently is growing with, with real visibility to um, bring it back on the decline, we've decided in here to put our foot to the accelerator and what the Padres can do to help. Under Seidler's ownership, the Padres were knocking on the door of a World Series in 2022. Fans say this next season should be about honoring his legacy. One thing I admire about P is he put his money where his mouth was. Like he invested damn near a billion dollars into the team and because he really wanted to win and I believe we owe it to him in 2024 to compete for Pete. And we do have a statement from Padre CEO Eric Grutner that came earlier today after Seidler's passing. He said in part that his impact on the city of San Diego and the baseball world will be felt for generations. His generous spirit is now firmly embedded in the fabric of the Padres. Although he was our chairman and owner, Peter was at core a Padres fan. He will be dearly missed. And as we come back out here live, we know that he is a larger than life figure for many Padre fans and other people in the community who will not soon be forgotten. And this spot where we're at right now, the home plate gate at Petco Park, it's going to be open through midnight tonight, and then it's going to be open again tomorrow from 6 a.m. to midnight if people want to come down and pay their respects. Live at Petco Park, Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. 
And thanks for that report, Matt. And earlier this year, I had a chance to talk with Peter Seidler about his commitment to San Diego from the Padres to helping the unhoused. You can find that story on the KPBS YouTube page. Teamsters union members walked off the job today on all 22 campuses of the California State University system. They are skilled trade workers claiming the CSU is not negotiating with them in good faith. Here's KPBS education reporter MG Perez to tell us more about the dispute. More than 1,100 Teamsters on Cal State campuses joined the one-day picket line and protest today, demanding the CSU negotiate with them for higher wages and better benefits. That's including a new salary pay structure. We caught up with Teamsters here on the campus of San Diego State this morning. These workers are plumbers, electricians, painters, and do many other jobs to support and maintain the university's facilities. They belong to the Teamster Local 20. 2010, which has been in negotiations with the school system for months. The Teamsters say they are making 23% less than their skilled trade counterparts on the UC campuses. We're not asking to be rich. We're just asking to be able to provide for our families and a few more percent because of inflation and the cost of living. And this is San Diego. I mean, California as a whole is expensive, but San Diego is the number one cost of living right now in the country. And we're making wages that we were making years ago. It's, it's just not enough. This was just a one-day unfair labor strike, not a planned ongoing work stoppage. The Teamsters will be back on the job tomorrow. As for the university system, a spokesperson provided KPBS with this written statement. Teamsters are important members of the California State University and contribute to our educational mission. The CSU and Teamsters have reached impasse in their contract negotiations, but are still engaged in the bargaining process under state law. The CSU remains committed to the collective bargaining process and reaching a negotiated agreement for increased compensation with the Teamsters, as we have done with five of our other employee unions in recent weeks. All Cal State universities remained open today using contingency plans to keep operations going and classes in session. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Here come the changes. We go to Wednesday. The wet weather will be rolling in, not only at the shoreline and throughout the interior valley, but uh, stretching out into some of the mountainous terrain. This is going to put a little bit of a lid on the warmth. Those temperatures will be trending down, but this is not the only wave of moisture we're going to be following. Another wave set to move in later on this week. More details on that, as well as your temperatures a little bit later on. The city of San Diego is beginning its search for a new police chief. David Neslight, who took the job in 2018, says he will retire in June. He rose through the ranks during his 36 years with the San Diego Police Department. The city has hired a recruitment firm to find potential candidates and says community forums will be held to help inform the process. A cybersecurity attack on Tri-City Medical Center is having ripple effects on the health care system in the North County. KPBS North County reporter Jacob Ayer has a look at what it could mean for other hospitals and patients. Tri-City Medical Center has declared this an internal disaster and is still diverting ambulance traffic to other hospitals. Last Thursday, the hospital announced it had become aware of a cybersecurity attack and took its systems offline. Hospital management says they're still serving patients with emergency needs, but they've halted all elective medical procedures. So right now, they're still probably in response mode, trying to figure out what happened, trying to contain uh, the infection, trying to see how far it spread. Cybersecurity professor Nicholas Behar says hospitals and healthcare facilities face extra risk for cyber attacks due to their wide range of medical devices. And so when you have those types of devices, that's a lot of the times going to leave you vulnerable because those devices aren't updated as often as, you know, regular computers. And the high stakes work environment. Because the patient's life is depending on those devices. This isn't the first local healthcare organization to be affected. UC San Diego Health, Sharp Healthcare, San Isidro Health, and Scripps Health have all dealt with data breaches of different sizes in recent years. It was hell on earth, let me tell you. Scripps Health CEO Chris Van Gorder says a 2021 ransomware attack had major impacts on their organization. But the first thing you have to do is stop the intrusion. And that means going to paper 
everywhere, meaning runners, you know, are running reports back and forth. And so you really have to change your operations completely. Since Tri-Cities internal disaster was declared, Van Gorder says Scripps has received 20 to 25 more ambulances per day, primarily in Encinitas. They normally receive around 35 at that location. Donis, we are on what we call code ABC, which is all bed crisis, meaning that our hospital is absolutely full. And at any one time, we may be having patients waiting, could be a significant number of patients waiting to be admitted to hospital beds, or we even have to transfer some of those patients to other Scripps facilities. Kaiser Permanente San Marcos said they have seen significant increases in the emergency department volume since the Tri-City Internal Disaster Declaration. Palomar Health says they had a slight increase in some ambulance traffic initially, but that's now leveled off. Behar says the cyber criminal landscape has shifted in the last few years, so they can work together more easily to compromise organizations. A matter of there's more actors out there that are launching these types of attacks. As for Tri-City patients, Behar says to be vigilant and practice basic cyber hygiene, like creating strong and unique passwords, using multi-factor authentication, and keeping systems up to date in case the attackers get a hold of personal information. If your data has been leaked, uh, then you should do things like make sure you're checking your credit on a regular basis to ensure that no fraudulent accounts have been opened. You can also freeze your credit. Tri-City said they're working with law enforcement and cybersecurity specialists to investigate the attack, restore their systems, and try to prevent future attacks. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. On this vote, the yeas are 336, the nays are 95. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The House of Representatives voted to temporarily keep the government running ahead of the Friday deadline. New Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson reached across the aisle to work with Democrats. The same move that cost former Speaker Kevin McCarthy the job weeks ago. The continuing resolution would fund some agencies through January 19th and others through February 2nd. The bill now needs approval by the Senate, then a signature from the president. Tens of thousands of mostly Jewish people from around the country gathered at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. They're showing support of Israel and demand more be done to free hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. Laura Aguirre has more on the march. A sea of Israeli flags, Jewish people and supporters gathering in the nation's capital Tuesday. We will stand on the National Mall in the, in the most visible place in this country and say America will not stand for this. October 7th was a crime against the Jewish state, indeed against humanity. Israel will cease their counteroffensive when Hamas ceases to be a threat to the Jewish state. As Israel takes its retaliatory fight against Hamas into a second month, the toll on Gaza's civilian infrastructure has been devastating. Some March attendees worry the graphic images of war could shake President Joe Biden's pro-Israel stance. There's a lot of pressure for him to want to be moved in another direction, but so far he's, he's supporting Israel. That's the most important thing. Still others have a deeply personal reason for attending the march. The Hamas terrorist organization killed my cousin, Oria. Also in the spotlight at the rally, rising anti-Semitism, especially on some college campuses. Every university leader in this country has a responsibility to ensure that no student is intimidated uh, or harassed on campus because of their religion. My grandchildren look back at this moment. I want to be able to say I was there at a moment where our community and our country needed me to stand up for our country and our future. I'm Laura Aguirre for KPBS News. Well, cold and wet weather is on the way to San Diego this week. It's a concern for Border Patrol agents and immigration advocacy groups. In recent months, hundreds of migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. have camped along our border waiting to be processed. Advocates like Jacqueline Arellano with Border Kindness says she worries about the well-being of the migrants who are exposed to the elements. She fears they will fall ill with hypothermia or even die at the sites. They have no shelter beyond makeshift um, structures that are constructed from poles and tarps that have been donated. Um, a couple of tents and literally people are just sleeping on the ground with maybe a blanket over them. Border Patrol says it can take days to pick up migrants because of the large number arriving at once and the rugged terrain. 
Well, San Diego is the first county in the entire country to offer free lawyers to people in immigration court. KPBS border reporter Gustavo Solis says the program is making a big difference. Imagine standing in front of a judge and having to represent yourself in court in a language you don't speak and under a legal system you know very little about. What's at stake? Your right to continue living in this country. That's exactly what immigration court is like for thousands of people facing deportation. Shows like Law & Order give us the basics of our criminal justice system. Defendants get a free lawyer and everyone is presumed innocent unless they're convicted. But those rights do not exist in immigration court. These are life or death proceedings of tremendous gravity done in this crazy sort of, uh, sometimes you call it like a fast food setting where like you don't get a lawyer, you don't get right to access evidence. Bardis Vakili is a civil rights and immigration lawyer. You have to go up against an immigration lawyer from ICE, right? And then you have to do it all in front of a judge more times than not is former in ICE uh, a, a former ICE attorney, and so it's just the chips are stacked against folks. Vakili says deportation cases are very difficult, especially if a client is locked up in a detention center. From within the prison, the ICE jail, there, immigration jail, there is no access to the internet, so you can't gather uh, information about your case. You don't get appointed a lawyer. You can't work and make money, uh, so you can't really like hire a lawyer. It's very difficult to talk to your family from inside. But there's a county program that's trying to make immigration courts fairer. San Diego County's Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program uses taxpayer dollars to give immigrants access to free legal representation. Vakili is part of this program. He says the goal isn't necessarily to stop deportations. Not everyone wins uh, their immigration case, but we should get it right, the winners and the losers, and having a lawyer helps with that. And so that's what the goal of the program is, is to try to just inject that fairness. The program started last April, and it's going to cost about $4 million a year. Data shows that it's already having an impact. The number of people with legal representation has more than doubled since the start of the program. And immigrants who have lawyers are five times less likely to be given deportation orders compared to people who had to represent themselves. For immigration lawyers like Lauren Cusatello, that stat is kind of obvious. Well, let's start with language. Um, any evidence that you present to an immigration court has to be presented in English. And uh, any application or form that the court generates is written in English, it has to be completed in English. Imagine doing all of that without an attorney. And that's not even mentioning the legal argument you'd have to make. The burden is on that applicant to prove that they're eligible. So unlike a criminal court where we all know the government has the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, in immigration court it's almost always the other way around. In October, County Supervisor Joel Anderson tried to place limits on who could be eligible for legal representation, saying people with criminal convictions shouldn't be part of the program. We've got to be thoughtful in our approach and we have to draw definite lines. All I'm asking today is that we had guidelines that stop us from wasting money on people who prey on others. When we visited but dozens of advocates opposed his plan, arguing in a county meeting that it would violate the spirit of universal representation. Many of these individuals have lived in San Diego for most of their lives. They have jobs in the community, families, friends, and people who support them. Anderson's proposal failed. Paulina Reyes is a lawyer with the Immigrant Defenders Law Center. She says there's a misconception that people facing deportation aren't members of our community. Critics of the program often say taxpayer dollars should only benefit San Diegans. For us San Diegans, like this is my neighbor, this is, you know, my uh, fellow church member that is going through this process and it affects everyone. Reyes says deportations tear families apart and that impacts the entire community. We've seen it too on so many cases where one of the parent might be deported to um, to other parts of the world completely and then that leaves you know the single parent alone with the children. And Vakili argues that giving free legal representation can directly benefit American citizens. The other thing people I think don't understand is sometimes whether the person's even as uh, an American is in question, right? So there's cases where sometimes they detain people that they think are not U.S. citizens, and it turns out the person's U.S. citizen. So far, lawyers in the program have been assigned 868 cases. Most of them are still going through the court process. 
Of the completed cases, only about 10% of them ended in deportations, which is much lower than the national average. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. The 10 freeway in Los Angeles will not have to be demolished after a fire damaged support columns underneath. Governor Newsom gave this update today on a possible timetable for repairs. Uh, that we will not need to demolish and replace the I-10. We will continue the kind of repairs you're seeing being done behind me and continue a shoring plan to shore up this site. Again, 100 columns have been damaged, a 9 or 10 severely. But that shoring work will continue 24-7 and it will allow us to reopen for traffic the I-10 in a matter of weeks. The estimate currently is three to five weeks. About 300,000 people use the freeway every day. Its closure is impacting already congested traffic in Los Angeles. Authorities say the fire was set intentionally. So far, no arrests have been made. The overcrowding situation with dogs at the San Diego Humane Society has become more urgent as two contagious pathogens have spread through some of them at the society's main campus in Linda Vista. KPBS reporter John Carroll says there is one simple way you can help to resolve the crisis. One infectious pathogen moving through animals is challenging enough, but the San Diego Humane Society is now dealing with a double threat, including one pathogen they haven't dealt with before. This particular one, Strep epidemicus, is something completely new for us. We know it's out there, but it's very severe. Dr. Gary Weitzman says there are 1,800 dogs being housed across the Humane Society's five campuses. He says it should be half that. The president and CEO of the Humane Society is also a vet, and he says the overcrowding situation has contributed to the spread of disease. And we know the same circumstances that caused it to happen in our quarantine building here can happen everywhere and at every shelter and at every dog kennel. It's just too many dogs that are in one area. The spread of the pathogens forced the Humane Society to pause dog surrenders so people who can no longer care for a pet can't drop it off here until at least after December 1st. Fortunately, Weitzman says antibiotics are allowing them to eliminate the pathogens fairly quickly. We actually gave all of the affected dogs a dose of an antibiotic that actually thankfully uh, takes care of this issue within really a day. Unfortunately, the overcrowding problem isn't as easy to solve. The San Diego Humane Society currently has more than 100 puppies. As you might imagine, they're the ones that go the quickest, but they also have many more adult and senior dogs. A friend of mine here at the Society says you might want to consider adopting one of those because they adjust more quickly. They are potty trained and they are also a gift in your life. <laughs> Gary Weitzman says the Humane Society can help you out with whatever you need to keep your furry friend fed or cared for. We encountered this family on their way out with their new friend. We are all up full of love and you know need another another baby to give our love to. <laughs> it's a pretty safe bet that love will be returned many times over. John Carroll, KPBS News. Well, after some sunshine the last couple of days, along with some mild air, those high temperatures up into the 70s, mid to upper 70s, we have some changes on the doorstep as some of those changes are happening later on tonight in terms of the increase in cloudiness, perhaps even some late night wet weather, arriving more so in the first wave as we work our way into Wednesday. Another wave set to move in later on in the week Friday night. And of course, with the rain, we're going to be talking about some slightly uh, cooler air. Let's work our way into the short term for tonight. And again, right along the shoreline toward Chula Vista, for instance, could see a late night shower. Otherwise, clouds will be thickening. Lows drop into the mid 40s toward Oceanside and Ramona. Borrego Springs down to 51. Future cast also shows the clouds making their way in. And notice as we work our way toward the late night time frame, early morning, you start to see a little bit in the way of shower activity as we work our way into Friday night and also Saturday we'll see another uh, area of moisture begin to slide its way into the picture so kind of showery off and on as we go throughout the next several days 
Again, the higher amounts of rain will be off toward the north, but uh, there again is the potential here. We could see over a quarter of an inch, half an inch of rain in some locations, locally higher amounts over the higher terrain, especially as you work your way points to the north. All right, out of the coast, here's what we're looking at. And again, think of this precipitation as more of a marathon. It's not going to be in a short amount of time, but rather a couple of spells of rain coming in. Afternoon wise into Wednesday night here at the coast, and then there comes the rain again Friday into Saturday. Same situation here inland toward the interior valleys, Wednesday into Wednesday night, and then we'll see another round of wet weather Friday into Saturday. A little bit cooler as we go into Sunday. Showers also into the mountains both Wednesday and again as we head our way into Saturday and even as we head toward the deserts. Look at this. We could see some wet weather later on in the week. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Popic. I'm Jeff Bennett. Tonight on the News Hour, fighting rages around hospitals in Gaza as negotiations for the release of hostages continue. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. And here's a look at what we are working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on NPR's Morning Edition. Teachers discuss how they're approaching the conflicts in the Middle East and other difficult news stories. And KPBS Midday Edition is gearing up for what's expected to be a busy holiday travel season. What's new at the airport and how you can stay healthy while traveling. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following, by viewers like you. Thank you.